Hello and welcome to Theology Unleashed, the channel where Eastern theology meets Western skepticism. Today, oh dear, he's not there. Um, oh, I set up the stream on the other one and then I, I didn't bring him in. Hang on, let me bring my guest into this stream. Um, today we've got Graham M. Schwig on again and we're going to be continuing some of the topics from last week. And um, let me quickly get him into the stream so you can see him. But uh, Graham, thanks for coming on again. Thank you. Oh, there he is. So that Thank you for working. having me. I'm not sure why the other one's not working. I'll jump to this scene while well, I figure out why that's happening. Um, and Samuel's coming on, and we're going to be asking questions um, to our esteemed scholar. So I'll start by bringing up one of the questions that uh, was from last week. So Brian Harris was asking, uh, the Trinity is sel seldom invoked in interfaith dialogue, even if there have been correspondences drawn with Sat Chit Ananda, and is often seen as a barrier. Could it actually be an asset in engaging with Trika, triadic Shaivism, which is both theistic and non dualistic? <clears throat> well, while I am confessionally someone who got his doctorate in comparative religion. I learned that you can only really compare religions limit. So, and, 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 you know, sometimes comparing means different things like equating one religious uh, configuration with another religious configuration or theological configuration with another theological configuration. I think we have to be very, very careful not to make too many assumptions, even though it's very tempting, right? The Trinity. Uh, and then, of course, we've got the cosmic Trinity in Hinduism, as, as scholars like to point out. Um, you know, just because there's three in one tradition and three in another tradition doesn't mean that they can be correspondingly related. So I prefer to point out that really there is a kind of axis within each tradition and you could call it an axiology where really the thing that gives the different elements of a religion um, their vibrancy is the axis around which they revolve so you could have a sacred rock in one tradition and a sacred rock in another tradition but just because they're rocks doesn't mean that they're they're similar or the same. It's the axis around which each of those sacred rocks revolve that give them their potency and their meaning to followers and practitioners. So that said, I'm sort of setting up my response uh, to that question by saying it's I would hesitate to equate those three types of triadic or um, tripartite structural designations in each of those traditions. They're really quite different. Really quite different. Is there anything that you would um, call a, a parallel to the Trinity? I mean, well, you mean in, uh, in, in Vaishnava traditions? Yeah. Well, okay, I mean, let's, let's do a little experiment here, okay? Let's do a little bit uh, free thinking. Well, the father. Well, let me tell you a little story, okay? Just a tiny little story. I once gave a lecture at the Brooklyn Krishna Temple, a Sunday feast lecture. And <clears throat> there was, at the end, I asked if there were any questions, and a young lady raised her hand. And she said, I'm very interested in becoming a Krishna Bhakta, but my parents are very devout Christians. How do I help them understand what I'm doing? And I said, why don't you ask them what it is they love so much about Jesus? What do they love so much about Christianity? And invite a conversation, invite a dialogue, invite a mood of sharing, because after all, that is what bhakti is. Bhakti means sharing. It can mean sharing in different ways. And this is one of the ways. So she really liked my response. But then the, the temple president raised his hand and 
and said, I'm really surprised that you said that. I'm really surprised because, you know, you should, I think, point out that God the Father is Krishna. And, you know, and and, and the son is, you know, and, and he, tr he tried to bring the Christian trinity into uh, a kind of, um, uh, sort of uh, shall we say, identification with some theological aspects of Krishna Bhakti. Now, generally, you know, devotees do not think of Krishna as father. I mean, we really don't, you know, in, in, the, in the Krishna Bhakti tradition, we don't really find, you know, uh, uh, bhaktas praying to Krishna as father, father Krishna. We don't really say that. Now, in the Bhagavad Gita, he does identify himself as the father of the universe, the father giving seed uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the womb of Brahman, okay? 14th chapter, third verse. But it's just not the right rasa. God the Father is very much a Christian rasa. It's a Christian relationship. And bhaktas really, if anything, think of themselves as the father of Krishna, uh, not themselves as the children of Krishna, but the father of Krishna or the mother of Krishna, as in Vatsalya Rasa. So you see, it's just very different. It's very different. Now, you know, um, what do we, what, what, what is found uh, in song during Christmas time? Um, oh, come, let us adore him, right? I'm not going to try to sing the whole thing because you'll instantly cut me off. I know that, Arjuna, because I am not any kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know, trained singer. Now, come let us adore him. What does that mean? They're adoring the baby Jesus. Okay. Now, okay. D don't Krishna Bhaktas adore baby Krishna? Yes, they do. So there's adoration of baby Krishna. There's adoration of baby Jesus. Does that mean that Jesus is Krishna and Krishna is Jesus? No. Honestly, I get very impatient when I see little um, depictions of Jesus and Krishna in the clouds holding hands together to save the world. I, this is, to me personally, this is a turnoff. You know, it, it's... It, these are different, and, and they're beautiful rasas. The Christian rasas are different than the Vaishnava rasas. There can be some similarity in relational dynamics, but, you know, um, if, if anyone here has had children, the same child, you, you don't relate to the same child exactly the same way you relate to the next child. They're different. They're different. They have different personalities, different characters. The Christian ethos is just a very particular kind of mood and it has a certain tenor. The, the, the kind of ethos of Krishna Bhakti and its five rasas has its a particular tenor. Um, you know, the guru is often seen as a kind of Jesus figure, you might say. But then, you know, again, that gets complicated. It really does. It gets complicated. The Holy Spirit. Well, okay, Paramatman. Are we talking about Paramatman? Are we talking about Brahman? Spirit. You know, again, what is meant by the Holy Spirit? Um, the, the presence of the divine uh, without, the presence of the divine within, without Brahman or the Viratarupa all around us. Uh, or the Antaryaman, the indwelling Lord within the heart, um, is, uh, would be the Paramatman. The Holy Spirit, is, is it that? Is it all of that? Is it partly that? Again, you know, the axiology is what's important here. The axiology is important. So take our, our friend here, Sam, right? That's your name, right? Sam, right? Yeah. He's got a nose. And I've got a nose. Well, both noses are used for breathing. Okay, I can grant it. But my nose is a good bit bigger than his nose. And it's got a different shape than his nose. And it's on a different face 
for which he probably is grateful than his nose. Okay. So the point is, there are many factors to deal with when you're looking at different traditions in comparison to one another. Very difficult, very difficult to say that I have the exact same nose or something extremely close to the nose that's on Sam's face. I mean, you can push me further if you want, but it's these these issues of comparative religion. I look, I spend many, I spent 13 years at Harvard getting two master's degrees and a doctorate in comparative religion, all to find out at the end that you really can't compare religions. I mean, you can, but you can't. And, you know, it's embarrassing. I mean, right there behind me on my diploma, it says religionum comparationum in Latin, comparative religion. So, you know, every tradition is unique. It has a certain flavor. It it arises from a different palette of paints. The, the palette of South Asia is different than the palette of the Middle East, the Semitic palette. Yes, are there reds and greens and blues and yellows, the primary colors, secondary colors on each of the palettes? Yes, but those colors, if you want to take the metaphor further, the, the pigment come from that area of the earth that's different than the pigment that comes from South Asia. Yes, there's a red on the one palette and there's a red on the other palette. What about the Far Eastern palette? They have all the colors too, but they do different things. They paint different landscapes and they paint different portraits. Anyway, I don't want to go on too long, but uh, you know, this is, this is what's so complicated and so nuanced when we start getting into comparative religion. But it's interesting, going back to my little story about the temple lecture, that uh, we are all too ready sometimes from our respective traditions to tell other people what they are doing in their traditions. I don't think that's a good idea. No one can tell another person who it is that they love. By the way, God the Father, by the, do you know who that is? We know who that is. That's Krishna. Uh-uh. That's not a good thing. <laughs> because that's not what they know. That's not what they love. What do you think about the comparison of Jesus to Balaram? You know, like we say, you, you can't obtain Krishna without Baladeva's mercy, Baladeva's Guru Tattva. Yep. Well, you know, I mean, uh, uh, the the, the um, many Christians like to come uh, to quote John fourteen. I think it is one fourteen. Uh, no one comes unto the Father except through me. Um, some some Catholics uh, feel that you can't get near God the Father unless you get the the grace of Mother Mary. So you know, again, it depends on which tradition within Christianity you're t you're speaking about. Um, and for, for Protestants, they don't really, you know, they don't really see anything between um, them, themselves and, and God. There's, there's, there, it's more immediate rather than uh, any kind of medial personalities. Of course, we do have, you know, the angel Gabriel, when, the, when God tells, uh, you know, um, Abraham, to go sacrifice um, Isaac, um, you know he he asks he asks him to do so, and Abraham is very very obedient. Humbly takes him to the mountain. Of course, Isaac doesn't know that he's going to be sacrificed. This was a regular um, a ritual that they had to sacrifice a goat. But Isaac said, "Where's the goat?" And Abraham didn't say anything. <laughs> so that was a little ominous. And Isaac came soon to understand, uh, I think I'm the, uh, I think I'm going to be the goat. Or I'm sorry, the lamb. It's a lamb, sacrificial lamb. I have a hard time telling the difference between lambs and goats, honestly, okay? But 
I'm not, I'm not very zoologically informed. But the idea is he, you know, Isaac obviously prepared the, the funeral pyre, the, uh, not the funeral pyre, the sacrificial arena, and which would become his funeral pyre. And anyway, you know, he's about to slit the throat of Isaac for the sacrifice, which is what he would have done with the lamb. And the angel Gabriel came and stopped him. Now, personally, I think that's really unfair. I mean, God was the one who told him to do it. Why does he send a secretary to stop, you know, Abraham from <laughs> sacrificing his only son, his beloved son, which took him years to, you know, uh, to, 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 you know, uh, have, have come into the, his life. But um, so there are, you know, there are angels you know, like Gabriel, Michael, there's some others, but angels, you know, are, what would, how would they be equated to the, 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 uh, the, the Hindu uh, situation or the Vaishnava situation? Demigods? Are angels demigods? It's very, very tough. It's very, very tough. You know, I just gave a lecture at the Smithsonian showing how East is East and West is West. And even though they meet, many of the things that you find you would only expect in the West and many of the things you'd only expect in the East, many of those dimensions actually could be found in India, theogeographically situated between the East and the West. But even then, they take on a different feeling and a different quality to them. Um, I don't know if I can show my screen here. But um, that was um, a slide I showed uh, the East and West characteristics uh, one by one. Like, for example, you'd expect to find, uh, you know, God in the West, transcendence in the East, you know, prayer in the West, meditation in the East, um, singular religious membership in the West, multiple religious membership in the East. Um, and then the list goes on, you know. Uh, um, uh, sort of intensive exclusivity in the West, intensive inclusivity on the East. A, a negative relationship with nature in the West, a positive relationship with nature in the East. Now I'm painting with broad brushstrokes here, but there really are amazing varieties and differences. So what links them all? one might say. What links all these traditions? Is there anything? Well, I have some opinions on that. I don't know if you want me to go into that. but uh, Yeah, sure. You know. Oh, yeah? Yeah, you think I could just go into that? Just like, freely? You think I could just like, just, you know, just, oh, yeah, okay, I can. Okay, I will. Okay, <laughs> as best I can. Well, you know what I like? You know, you know the Gita? The Gita propounds an amazing concept that shraddha faith the word for faith in Sanskrit shraddha in the 17th chapter right at the beginning Krishna speaks about how there is faith in every human being faith is there in everyone it doesn't matter if you're an atheist or a non-theist or a theist, or some kind, or any variation therein, or thereof. Faith is a, is a, um, an irreducible quality of hu of the human being. Then the question is whether it's a dark faith, a healthier faith, and a pure faith. Tamasa, Rajasa, and Sattvika. So faith is there, and you know the word faith in Sanskrit. Sanskrit uh, is a beautiful language, and the word shraddha, which is easily translated as faith, is composed morphologically of two parts. Shrad, which means heart, and dha, which means where you place the heart. It means placement. Where you place your heart, that is your faith. And everyone places their heart somewhere. It's just a question of where. So by way of extension, I would say that all religion, all human practices are about 
something of the heart, some dimension, some aspect, some development of the nature of the heart. And how high can the heart reach? And what regions can one reach? I think that's what the human enterprise is all about. It's about the heart. Cool. Did, did that's you, what I would put as the essence. Nice. Did you have any, did you want to go somewhere with that, Samuel, or there's uh, another related question I could read out? Um, not, not anyone in particular. Um, yeah, although, yeah, it's interesting to, to note the, um, the cognate um, Latin word credo, you know, I believe it's also related to cordia or the heart cord right. in Latin. Well, um, however, in, in Greek though, um, that, um, the word is, the, 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 the word is not seen in pistis, the Greek word for faith, that association with the heart. However, if the, when in the prayer of the heart, a lot of Eastern Christianity, they still have that association with other words. So, so right, yeah, it's, right, interesting. So, so certainly, certainly, there's still that association with all of the mystical traditions of many traditions yes. focus on um, the prayer of the heart um, or the heart in general, which is seen as yes. the yeah. I mean, it means different things in different contexts, but yeah. So yeah, yeah. I, I don't have any other thoughts on that, but yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, okay, go ahead, Arjun, yeah. I was just going to ask this question from Rob B. Was Jesus wrong when he said no one goes to the Father except through him? And then he said something about Krishna being the Father. So is Jesus wrong being that with Krishna consciousness we are given the Father? <laughs> well, you know, there are other um, statements in the, um, I mean, Jesus himself said, in my Father's house there are many mansions. And... Um, and even uh, Paul addresses how there is uh, uh, faith in different nations. So, you know, one has to look, one has to be careful not to take one quote, one tiny little passage and uh, globalize it. One really has to see it in light of all the passages uh, of, the, of, of what the tradition says. Otherwise, we will fall into a kind of myopia and a kind of dark interpretation of scripture. So, you know, the thing is that um, there's no doubt that one uh, comes to the Father, to to Jesus's Father, uh, through Him, for sure. Uh, it's not saying that that you know you can't go to your Father, you know, through another means. Um, it's, it's Jesus' particular father. Let me invoke the, the sort of family metaphor again. So I've got a few kids. You know what? Each one sees me differently. There, there's a different father. I swear we've got four fathers here. Okay? There's four and one. Each kid sees a part of me that the other kids don't see. So, you know, when we speak in exclusive language, it doesn't exclude the inclusive uh, reality of the situation. And then, of course, now I can always invoke, you know, the six blind men and the elephant, the famous parable. You know, the king sends the six blind men out to see what they could find. They all come across the elephant, right? And, uh, and, and you know, one says, oh, I found a wall beside of the elephant. One found a tree trunk. It's the, it's the, uh, the, 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 the leg of the elephant. One found a spear. It's the tusk. Etc. Etc. Were they all right? Were they all wrong? Yes. Both. <laughs> so, you know, it's you know you know I I saw once a bumper sticker, and you know um, I'm not usually abused by bumper stickers, but I saw one bumper sticker I really liked. God is too big to fit in any one religion. I think that's there's something to that, you know. I mean, I again, uh, excuse me for invoking a bumper sticker instead of you know sacred, you know writings here. But you never know what you're going to find on a bumper sticker, right? 
So this one seemed to ring true. God is too big to fit in one religion. No one religion can have some kind of monopoly or exclusive claim to all of reality. How absurd is that? But they can have an exclusive claim to a particular kind of relationship that they can have, and that's healthy. It's unhealthy when you start claiming that everyone else should have the exact same relationship that you have to absolute reality. Then that's unhealthy. I, you know, Arjuna, I can tell you that you should love, you know, uh, uh, Beethoven's uh, first violin concerto. You know, you should love that. And and, and you just tell me and say, well, I just I just don't like Beethoven. No, 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 no. No, you don't understand. He is the only music that's really worth listening to. I mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe you like Jay Z, uh, or, or uh, not that familiar with a lot of the popular, you know, um, um, uh, you know, whatever. Um, Red Hot Chili Peppers, or something like that. Back in my day, the Beatles, or whatever. I mean, you cannot tell someone who to love. Religion is a little like art. You either are in love with it or you're not. If in religion you're you're attending religion because there's some kind of fear element or obligatory element, like uh, you know, or or, or um, some kind of demand, you know, Jesus, you know, loves you. I see these billboards on highways in America. Well, the implication is, why don't you love Jesus? Why do I need to see big billboards saying Jesus loves you? I mean, Arjuna, I love you, man. Now, I'm expecting you to tell me that you love me back. But you know what? Nothing's forthcoming, is it? Okay, so, okay, so there's a... There's a guilt factor there. I'm not even going to like, talk to Sam. I mean, if I can't get it out of you, why would I even get <laughs> Sam to say that he loves me? I mean, you know, you know, it, it, relationships really treasure balance. And Krishna in the Gita says, I am in the hearts of all living beings for an eternity. I love no one. I hate no one. I'm neutral to all. So you see, there's no pressure there. But then he says, but my bhakta, when my bhakta loves me, I love them like anything. Now, of course, I'm paraphrasing the verse. You know, once on, on the college campus, you know, when you in between classes, you know, the, the, the walkways get crowded, right? Because everyone's going to a different class, right? <laughs> So I was following these two young ladies. I mean, I wasn't following them, but you know, we were going in the same direction and they were in front of me. They were students. As a professor, I was trying to get to my classroom. As students, they were trying to get the, to theirs. Well, I couldn't help but over here a little bit, okay? So one girl said, does Mike still love you? And the other one quipped and said, he better or I'll kill him. You can imagine how I was so taken aback by this. Mike either was going to, under duress, have to love this girl, or he would be dead, or he would die. Well, you can imagine how nervous I was for Mike. He was in a very bad situation. You can't force someone to love you. And somehow in religion, like this girl thinks some religions think that you need to force people to love what they love. It just doesn't work that way. It just, oh, it works if you want to kill people and, you know, you want to have, you know, uh, you know, wars over, or, or if you enslave people, the African Americans, the, the Africans that were brought to this country and uh, with their, and, and put under the, um, 
ownership of slave owners, they forced the Africans who had their own indigenous traditions that were very much loved and practiced. They forced these Africans to be Christians. And what a really nice Christian thing to do. <laughs> you know, I mean, Jesus is known as the Prince of Peace. And these in, in, enslaved human beings were forced to be Christians. And if they if there was any hesitation, they would be beaten or killed. So this is how Christianity, in large part, is spread by force. As sad as it is. I mean, this is religion gone bad. All religions have the capacity to go bad. Christianity is no exception here. But when religions are good, they are too absorbed in in, in, in loving God to to be forcing others uh, to love God. One of the ways I respond to that qu exclusivist quote from Jesus that the question was about is to say, um, if Jesus is speaking as God when he says, I'm the only way, then he's just saying you need God's mercy to attain God. And I don't think there's a theist anywhere in the world that disagrees with that idea. <laughs> yeah. Okay, it's good. Now, you see, now, again, this comes into an interpretation of who Jesus is. Different traditions see Jesus as, uh, you know, a particular, you know, it's the Trinitarian interpretation, you know. Um, first of all, there is no Trinity in the New Testament. This is a later development in the history of Christianity. Um, even Trinitar yeah, Trinitarian mysticism is a later development. Even the symbolism of the cross is a later development, several centuries later at least. Uh, the original symbol of Christianity was a fish. So, you know, symbols change, interpretations change, and again, it's how we understand and encounter Scripture. But we're not here to encounter it for others. You know, my mother used to, when I was a child, my mother was a fine artist, and, we, and I grew up in Washington, D.C. In Washington, D.C., there are beautiful, fantastic, you know, art museums. So my mother would take me down to the art museums, and, and we would spend Sundays there. And I would go around myself, and I never saw anyone come up to someone in the Baroque gallery saying, excuse me, sir, you are in the wrong gallery you should come to the Impressionists gallery. That's the real painting. These are like substandard paintings. These are not the real thing. The real paintings are in the, the Impressionistic gallery, like Monet's and, uh, and, and, and Renoir's, not these Rembrandt's, you know, and Rubens. Who are these people? You know, uh, you know and so it, it, each realm of theology has its special gifts. And if it can be anchored in some dimension of the heart, some dimension of love, which it, I believe is always there, the question is whether we can find it, whether we can know it. If we can know it and we can find it, it is there, and that then becomes something really worthy of sharing. And that's the meaning of bhakti, is sharing. Can I say something about the um, that John passage, I, you know, by Jesus, just briefly? Yes, please. I'd be interested. Um, yeah. So I, while I agree with you that there's no um, explicit Trinitarian kind of theology in um, in John's Gospel and more broadly in the New Testament, in the in the same way that you have, you know, particularly in the third and fourth centuries, um, I think that the you know john's gospel has a kind of what's often called a logos theology um yes you know the greek logos is the kind of the uh in greek it's kind of the deuteros theos or the, like a second god as as um philo of alexandria often put it um it's, it's kind of the um mediator uh, sort of principle if you will that makes known the unknown god if you will 
Um, and, and of course, in at the beginning of John's Gospel, it says in you know Kaiho Logos um, um, sucks again at all, and the log and the word the Logos became flesh in Jesus. Right. right. So in light of that, I would as a Christian, I and I interpret the verse um, in chapter fourteen, verse six, where you know um, Jesus responds to Thomas and he says, "Who's asking? Where do we go?" <laughs> um, Right. Thomas, he, is, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. I interpret the through me there as the Logos speaking, because only the Logos, can, you know, it's only because Jesus incarnates the Logos that he can actually say, I am the way. You know, not just I am our way, but I am the way, the truth, the life, you know, and so on. So, right. so yeah, so while, you know, a lot of Christians might and have argued, you know, that that passage oh, yeah. is exclusivist. Um, and, yes. Um, I, I I think that there's warrant within aspects of the gospel um, to interpret it in a more inclusivist way um, so that, you know, you can say that the Logos, though it's incarnated, incarnated fully in some sense in Jesus, it is beyond, goes beyond the physical, um, historical person of Jesus. And... Yeah, and so that's how you, it can still be true that no one comes to the Father or no one knows of the unknown God, but through the visible image, which is the Logos yeah. of the Son, right? Um, yeah, so yeah, that's just my take on on that. So, well, I appreciate that take. I appreciate that take, and 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 I what I appreciate even more than the particular take, although I do appreciate that, is that you're calling it a take. That's Sam's take. Now, others will have their takes. And you know what? That's all right. That's okay. Why should humans beat each other over the head? Because your take is not my take. In art, like I said, we don't have that problem in the art galleries. Wait a minute, you're interpreting the Rembrandt this way? Wait, whoa, whoa, uh-uh, you know? And then and we get into a fist fight. I've never seen this in an art gallery. I don't even know of it ever happening in an art gallery. Um, now, the history of art does have its kind of funny and strange things, and we won't get into that, but I'm making a sort of general analogy that if we really connect with what we love about a tradition and the way you just in, 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 interpreted it uh, Sam there's something quite beautiful about that okay I, I mean I saw something quite beautiful about it Arjuna probably didn't I mean I'm, I mean I'm you know maybe I, I'm speaking for him but let's just say he didn't okay that's okay that Arjuna didn't see anything beautiful about it it's okay that I did and it, it, it's about going to the essence of every tradition. There is some revelation of an aspect of the heart. It stands to reason that if the most powerful striving in humans is love, then it's an easy inference to make that at some level, at some essential level of all religion, there is some revelation of the heart. If practitioners locate that, find that, understand that, and revel in that, it will only produce the most uplifting and, and grandest achievement for humankind. That's my unhumble opinion. It's, it's a beautiful point. I, I think it's worth pointing out one of the differences between how people view art and how many people view religion, which is to blame for the fighting, which is that with art, <laughs> yeah. we're thinking, oh, that's great. You're enjoying that painting in this way. I'm enjoying it another way. Oh, that's great that you're appreciating that painting. I appreciate this painting more so. That one's not really doing it for me. And people just think, you know, whatever. People are enjoying looking at art. It's nice, you know, they're yeah. entertaining themselves. Whereas with religion, they think, 
oh my god these people are going to hell they're going to suffer an eternity forever i need to save them and this per person who's yes. convincing people of this alternative doctrine is bringing more people to hell so i need to violently impede their actions yeah exactly but that assumption that 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 a presumption the presumption that others are going to hell and i'm not and that I'm told to give the good news, the gospel. You know, it, it's it there, there's, it's 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 so reductive and disrespectful to other human beings and disrespectful to their hearts. Find out what it is that they love. I and I think I said on on the last podcast we did together, I love Augustine's, you know, that question that Augustine asks in the Confessions. What do I love when I love my God? That's a wonderful question. This is what we should be asking of each other. So what do you love when you love your God? You know, Or what do you love when you embrace all reality? You know, if you're talking to, say, a Buddhist or talking to a Taoist, what do you love? Tell me, what is it that you love? What holds you there in your tradition? I think these are the most valuable discussions and the kinds of dialogues that the world so desperately needs. Um, back on the point of inclusivism and relating it to people who have these beliefs that result in them violently opposing other religions, um, when we're being inclusive about other people's religious beliefs, I think we, we have to be choosy about what we include. We can't just include every kind of belief under the sun because some people believe that uh, God has got told me to go around killing prophets of other religions and so on and not just uh, well, not just draw well, the God line there but draw the line a little bit before there maybe at the, at the world view that enables something like that to even begin to make sense yeah um Arjun, I don't mean to be personal, but did God ever t tell you that? I mean, no, I, no, I no. But there, I mean, there's examples in history. I, I, I just want to know. <laughs> I guess I, I'll need to protect myself here. You know, I, I mean, we are doing through the, the the internet here, so I feel a little safe. But, but, okay. <laughs> um, but, but I mean, but seriously, remember I, I spoke earlier about the Bhagavad Gita, and talked about faith that is dark. One can have everyone has faith according to the Gita. It is a ubiqui it's, it's it's ubiquitous. It's it's universal. It's it's in every every heart, every human heart. But if my faith is dark and it's destructive and it's harmful to others, uh, then that yeah, that's going to be something that you won't want to encounter. That's um, uh, and, and usually, and here's the catch, uh, a, a very good scholar wrote a book called God, Guilt, and Death. I forgot his name. Uh, starts with an F. Um, but anyway, uh, he wrote it years ago, a scholar at Fordham University. Um, he no, explains that. Westfall. Westfall. That's right. Good. Westfall. Good. Yeah. Um, Westfall. He, he, he writes a very interesting, so you know this, he talks about uselessness. And of course, he doesn't mean meaningless. He means that there should religion, whenever it's used for any kind of external need or motive, then it's not it's not pure. If if religion is to fulfill some kind of you know territorial need, polit socio political need, um, uh, you know personal you know need, a vendetta, whatever then you see it's just being used it's not religion for its own sake now the fact is in the in the hebrew bible god does tell you know jonah uh he comes to jonah and said i want you to go to nineveh and i want you to tell everyone to stop sinning and uh, and of course, you know, I mean, I mean, what is Jonah going to say? Uh, no, I'm I have a busy schedule. Um, I'm sorry, I can't do that, uh, God. No, I mean, you're going to say yes because it's too scary to say no. Um, I believe he did. It's been a long time since I read it, but 
I believe he did express some trepidation, like, well, who will believe me? You know, no one's going to believe me that God, that you told me this. Um, and he's, and he said, you have to go. And he said, okay. And of course, as soon as God left, what did, what did Jonah do? He ran in the opposite direction toward the ocean or toward the Mediterranean. He got on a boat. You know what happens? The boat, then, you know, undergoes all kinds of turmoil in the sea and it, the boat capsizes and the he gets thrown off the boat and ends up in the belly and the digestive juices of a whale. And the whale then vomits him back on land closer to Nineveh. So basically, he got a free ride to Nineveh, not the most enjoyable transportation. But um, uh, because I, I can't imagine being in, you know, in an underground submarine with no windows and basically swimming around in uh, digestive juices of a huge mammal. But anyway, he makes it to Nineveh and finally, you know, fulfills God's order. But, you know, I mean, so, you know, if, if you are a prophet and you're supposed to, you know, do something like that, well, I've got good news in one sense. Um, Muhammad is the, supposed to be the last and final prophet. Which, you know, honestly, when I found that out, I was disappointed. I thought I would be a prophet one day. Well, when I found that out, obviously I couldn't. So instead I became a prophet sort. You know, professor. Pro <laughs> okay, okay. I don't think the internet's good for joking. I really don't. It's, you, you can't get quite the response that you might in person. But, but seriously, when religion, and let's go back to Merrill Westfall, um, when religion is used for something else other than that for which it was intended essentially, then we've got problems. And, you know, if you have illusions of grandeur and you think you're a prophet, you need to tell everyone to, to, to repent and, and so on. I mean, well, you know, you may have to suffer the consequences. But it's sad when others also suffer the consequences. Yeah. Um, we were also wanting to move on to discussing Advaita and and the the debate there. Um, oh, yeah. We, we touched on it briefly with David Bentley Hart, but I feel like we kind of just um, discussed the subject rather than actually getting into it. Like a, a it was like a meta discussion. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah. you know, there's there's the the old thing. Um, typical Harry Krishna preaching that this uh, any kind of impersonal ideas of God or, or prevent bhakti from really working because you need the bhakta to be a separate person from God. Of course, there needs to be some similarity. Otherwise, you can't have a relationship. Uh, just like my relationship with a cat can't be quite as great as a relationship with uh, my wife or my children because there's more similarity there, but then it also needs to be different. We have to be a different person. <laughs> and then um, you fi we find as Hare Krishnas were taught, you know, what Shankara taught, what the Advaitavadis are teaching is dangerous doctrine. It can hurt our bhakti. We need to stay away from it. And then we get into interfaith and we see Christians and we agree with them on so many things. And then when they, many of them look to uh, Vedanta traditions, we find them looking over at what we consider to be the atheism. They're taking yes. a lot, they're relishing the stuff from Shankara. And we're like, wait, what? I thought when you Christians were finding interesting things in Vedanta, they'd find the theistic bits interesting. And then, of course, they disagree when we say that it's atheism. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's enough to get us started. <coughs> oh, yeah. Oh, that's plenty. Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, well, first of all, um, not all impersonalisms or non, let's put it this way, non-theistic visions are the same. Just as not all theisms are the same. So we have to be careful of that. Now, many, you know, Hare Krishna devotees say that their tradition is monotheistic. Um, well, I, I have a problem with that because even when Christianity says it is monotheistic, I kind of call it tri monotheistic. Um, you know, uh, Monothe given the Trinitarian monotheism, you know, uh, you know, we could call it the, um, 
you know, three theism or tritheism, you know, a tritheism, sure. I would describe, and I have written, I've actually published this, but I've called Krishna Bhakti a polymorphic by monotheism. Because Radha and Krishna are at the very ultimate center and top of the theology, and so many forms, polymorphic, so many forms of the deity can expand and, and, and extend from them. But yet it's a theism. But it's a bi-theism because there's two of them. There's the divine feminine and the divine masculine. The, you know, Radha, Krishna. Now, when you talk about, you know, impersonalism, it just depends on what exactly you're talking about. Some uh, bhaktas are impersonalists. Say, Shukadev Goswami, who speaks the Bhagavata Purana. Uh, the four Kumaras are impersonalists. And they're impersonalists in a, a more innocent and positive way. Bec and, and why? Because their impersonalism, it's a little bit like, you know, Arjuna, if I never met you or your family, you know, I'm sure you have a lovely family, but let's say I somehow come to your house and no one's home. And, you know, you left me the key and I'm roaming around. I'm like, wow, what a nice home. Very nice home. I've never met you or your kids or your wife. But, you know, so it's in one sense, that's the impersonal energy. The house is the energy of the inhabitants that, that well, that live there. So in one sense, the, the, the positive part of impersonalism is to appreciate the energy of the divine, the energy of God. Something maybe akin to, dare I jump over to another tradition? The Holy Spirit. I mean, this is when, you know, maybe we can make that little leap. The Holy Spirit, that which pervades all. Where the theist, theistic bhakti tradition gets a little anxious is when impersonalism goes to what they call mayavadism, which actually I really think should be called mityavadism, because the famous Mahavakya, a great saying of Shankara, is Brahma Satyam Jagan Mitya. He asserts that the only reality is Brahman, absolute spirit. And this world is false. Not, not Ill, Ill, illusory. Not illusory. Buck does say it's illusory. But he, he comes out and says, not Maya, he says Mitya. Now that's really strong. That means, Sam, I'm looking at you. You're looking at me. Uh-uh. No. That's not happening, pal. No. And same with you, Arjuna. This is not happening. What's happening, what we think is happening right now, is not true. It's not happening. It's There's a kind of cognitive dissonance that's there. And, of course, anyone that claims that everything is false, well, they're going to be stuck because then their, their own statement and claim and assertion that everything is false is itself false. So, you know, this is like a crazy person. Everything's false. Well, well, you know, I, <laughs> that means what you've said is false. I can't take you seriously. And it frankly doesn't, you know, um, uh, work th out. You can't, you can't live with that kind of conception unless you're a complete solipsist and, and, you know, complete egotist. No one else really exists but myself. And I create my own worlds um, and so on. But but you know again this is this is the stuff of psychopathology. So impersonalism is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, to take uh, the bhakti formula, the Vedantic formula, achintya beda beda, beda abeda, to to understand that absolute reality is something that 
is, has infinite otherness and infinite non-otherness. It's infinitely broken, and, and that's not a good term, but I mean, beda means broken, but beda, um, uh, how do you say it? Infinitely differentiated. Infinitely differentiated. And not differentiated at all. At the same time, and achinta means there is absolutely no way I can think about that. I, I cannot, I cannot comprehend that. Being the case at the same time, but intellectually we can kind of analyze it a bit. So. So the bhakta then, loves the divine presence, the immediate presence of God, in the uh, in, in the abeda. And the uh, absence, the complete absence of God in everything, uh, and 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 the heart is is forever caught in this tension of God's presence and God's absence. So this is this is how Beda Beda functions within the experience of the heart in loving God. Love always means total acceptance, a total embrace, uh, a total praise. But it also involves the absence of 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 of, of the divine, a, a kind of remaining and sustained mystery of God that can never, whose depths can never be fully reached. It's it in fact it, it its mystery becomes more and more intensified the more and more one feels the divine pr loving presence of God. So there's this interesting dialectical tension which is increasing in, in, in the heart of every bhakta. I find this to be something true in mystical Christianity. You can find mystics that are absorbed in this kind of heart's immersion in the presence of God and the absence of God. Even when we embrace a friend, you know, you could say that we're one. But you also are embracing a friend and sending them the message, if you really love them, that I also want to know you more. There's a more that I don't know yet, but the, 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 the stuff I do know, I love so much, but there's a more that I want to know. I want to enter into the mystery of the other, but right now I'm experiencing the non-other in my embrace with you. This is the nature of love. This is the metaphysics of love. And love, and I'll just end on this, love is an energy. It's impersonal. But you can't have the impersonal without the personal. And you can't have the personal without the impersonal. So you can't have the love, by the way, a Sanskrit word uh, for love, is ananga, formless, limbless. But it happens between two persons that have limbs. Okay? So it takes the, 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 the impersonal energy of love that happens between Radha and Krishna obviously requires the forms of Radha and Krishna. Love takes lovers, and lovers experience the impersonal love, the energy of love. Now, the Mayavadism, what really gets under the skin of the bhakti theists is when they say God simply comes from the impersonal energy. That's really, if you want to get under the skin of a bhakta, that's all you have to say. God is simply uh, a manifestation of Brahman, which is temporary and not real the way Brahman is. So the Upanishads say that Brahman comes from Ishwara, or in the Gita, Brahmanohi Pratishtaham, that Krishna is the foundation of the Brahman, but the Advaitins or some extreme Advaitins will say that Brahman is the, uh, I'm sorry, that Ishwara uh, uh, subsumes, uh, Brahman subsumes Ishwara. So they reverse it. And that really gets to the Bhakta. If you really want to uh, uh, start a fight with a Bhakta, that's a good way to do it. Tell them that Krishna is a manifestation of Brahman. Ouch. You know. Can I ask a question here? Um, 
I I think David Bentley Hart mentioned in our last conversation the name of Anantanand Rambachan. He's a prominent scholar of um I know him personally. Advaita yeah. tradition. Yeah. Sure. Okay, that's We're good. good very good then. Um, so yeah. yeah. So the question I had was just particularly with regard to his work on like his his work, um, the Advaita worldview, and also he's also in another work as well. Um, but but yeah, uh, the, the so the question I had was just like, do you agree with his interpretation of like do you think that his interpretation of what the Advaita worldview is about, but which by which he, the way he understands, like he pushes against, like as you would know, he, he pushes against, you know, that division between um, Nirguna Brahma, the higher um, Nirguna Brahman and the lower Saguna Brahman. Right. Um, right. He doesn't think that, yeah. I mean, while those like Vivekananda have maybe you know, the interpretation has influenced the way that Shankar has been interpreted. Um, he doesn't think that's um, scripturally um, the most plausible way to read, like, Shankara, who, yeah, um, is always reading his stuff in the, you know, he's always rooting all of his experiences, so to speak, in the... Um, various scriptures that he's exegeting and interpreting, right? Um, so, I'm not sure exactly <laughs> what my question is. Because, um, so you know about his, his work. Um, so, yeah, I, I, as I take it, what he, the way he, um, takes the main, it's the essential insight of, um, the claim that, um, you know, Tatvam Asi, this, that thou art, or, you know, this Atman is Brahman, the way he takes it is, you know, it's about a transformation of the way you, you view the world. You know, you, you either, Avidya is not about, like, whether you, like, view the world as an illusion or not real or, or not, or you do. Um, well, you don't do that. It's more about like it, whether you whether you view the world as ultimately independent from Brahman or not. Like that's the way he phrases it. Like you know, um, that's how he phrases what a is about. Like either if you if you view reality or the world as um, either de, you know dependent on Brahman. So he's he, he thinks that Shankara is actually quote unquote theistic in the traditional classical theistic sense of you know there's you know brahman is um like the cause it, it cause and then the world is an effect but it's kind of the way he puts it it's an asymmetrical relation you know um right um yeah um so do you here's the question then do you agree with him that um, Shankara's uh, is not really a monist. <laughs> Do you agree with him that Shankara is not a monist in the sense that people often think? Because because I yeah. find his really, really plausible. So, first of all, I think that Professor Ramachan is uh, a brilliant scholar, and yeah. I think he's really onto something. Now, um, I don't necessarily think that many Advaitins would agree with him. Yeah. Okay, that are maybe a little more radical uh, uh, on the Adwaitan side of things, but yeah. I do agree with him, from what I remember in reading his work. I do agree with him in in um, the reading of Shankara, because when I read the Sharidaka Mimang Sabasha with uh, Hans van Boyten at the University of Chicago, mm -hmm. I was actually amazed how beautiful it was. In fact. I didn't expect how eloquently Shankara wrote. How beautiful. He was sort of like the Shakespeare of, of you know, Vedantic philosophy. Just this kind of monument. It was like reading, 
you know, um, you know, like a like a Shakespeare sonnet that was just so pithy and so to the point. Anyway, that's not quite a good uh, a comparison. I'm, I'm trying to think of something to compare it to. But in any case, Shankar was so uh, uh, just beautiful in his writing, and I did not expect. It was later interpreters of Shankara that then don't sound like uh, Professor Ramachand. Uh, Ram Ramachand's work really, I think, is grounded in this kind of, you know, sort of in th this kind of ground of theism, this kind of ground of theism and in, 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 uh, theistic positivity that's that's there in, in, in Shankara. And, you know, I've been uh, translating the Yoga Sutra lately uh, for Yale University Press. By the way, it's a few years overdue, so I don't like to talk about it, but uh, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to get done. Okay, I'm on sabbatical. I'm going to get it done in a half a year. But the Yoga Sutra has, and, and you know, I'm kind of reminded of Shankar a little bit because the Yoga Sutra, in some similar kind of way, of course, again, a Sanskrit text, has a kind of raw theism. It's raw, you know. It's not the specificity is not there, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, of nomenclature, of of uh, of, of identity and, and personality, but but it, there's a raw theism there. There's a raw uh, concept of grace in it. It's beautiful, just beautiful, and it's it's sort of like a. I mean, when you build a house, I mean. You know the house is most beautiful when it's actually fully built but but you know sometimes a foundation can be you know extraordinary the way it's there you know solid you know something solid and you can imagine something you can build on top of it i i think that's there in rambachan i think he brings it out in shankara something just monumentally foundational and 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 solid for a kind of raw concept uh, and preparatory concept of theism. I don't know if I'm, I'm I, I don't know if he, one, if you would like what I'm saying and two, whether I'm, I'm, I'm really pinpointing it the way I would even like to, but, but that's what I'm recalling in both Shankara and Rambachan. Other uh, interpreters of Shankara, they go this, this route of a kind of um, uh, a mitya idea that things are just false in this world. And, you know, you can't, you just can't explain it. You just have to, in fact, there's really no point in, in uh, uh, philosophizing because you just have to go into meditation and just wake up. You just have yeah. to wake up. You know, so there's no point in even discussing it. And then, and then of course, meanwhile, you know, you go to the, the mandir and you get prasad and, you know, you, you know, you, you, you enjoy the, 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 uh, the temple life, <laughs> so you know, it's sort of a uh, a strange uh, contradiction in a way. You know. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, so the way so, I thanks for that. That was helpful. Um, the yeah. way, yeah. So the way I take uh, that mitya phrase, um, according to like Rambachan's reading of it, is like is to say that what is false or illusory is the is our normal conventional kind of understanding of the world and ourselves as independent, as independent from, from Brahma, from Brahman, right? Um, that's what a vidya or ignorance is, is, right. you know, is it's about the way you view reality, you know, either as dependent on Brahman or so, so in that sense, reality, you can still retain the essential insight of, Shankara and you know all those other common analogies like the snake, uh, the rope being mistaken for the snake, and so on. You know, common analogies that um, you know you can still maintain the insight of those, which is that reality is not as it seems. <laughs> you know, because what reality seems to us to be some independent, autonomous, you know, enclosed kind of whole, but it's not. That's yeah. not reality. Reality is ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, um, dependent on Brahman, um, and this dependence isn't a separation. It's a, a, a you know, very close um, identity. You know, right? Um, yeah, and so that's what I, I've always like coming from someone coming from the Christian tradition, but coming particularly from the more apathetic 
uh, right. aspects of Christianity. So, yep. You know, that, that's how that's why I've been you know attracted to like Advaita Vedanta and um, I wish I define that term for everyone and all that sort of thing. Apathetic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can yeah. define it. Um, well, it, it just means the first one. Yeah. It just mean I mean the simplest way of upper fasties in Greek just means to unsay something. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean apathetic is usually contrasted to cataphetic, which means like positive, and so apathetic is supposedly means like negative theology. It's like you know what God is not, but I think that's a limited understanding of what upper fasces is. I think it's um, upper fasces is ultimately about you know unsane every sane, you know, real, recognizing that every sane, every assertion of God is limited, right? And that, that's so that's also what I take um the language of sagun i'm sorry nirguna brahman to to mean um brahman i like i mean literally like people think of formless brahman you know brahman without qualities or or whatever but like i think that's like if you if you're imagining like some entity you know some like transcendent entity what you call Brahman that has no qualities. I think you're already missing the point of what that yeah. that phrase is supposed to mean, which is that because it's supposed to mean, as I understand it, you know the that what Advaita means, you know, non-dual, and if something's non-dual. <laughs> then there's still a distinction you're making between Brahman as a you know an existent and the quality or the tr- um, the quality or the property of Brahman as being without qualities. There's there's that duality there, you know, in making that assertion. So people who think that that's what it's about, you know, you, you're believing in this kind of impersonal blob. <laughs> like, yeah. I, yeah. I, I think they, they're just missing the point, like what, apoph- what the apophatic kind of impulse is supposed to convey, which is, which is that there's always a beyond any every assertion you know, that you know even even the claim that you know brahman is you have to unsay the claim that brahman is um nirguna without qualities as well right because that's you know also there's also there's still a duality in you saying that right yes so anyway that's i just wanted to hear any thoughts on that so yeah, <laughs> yeah well i mean the, you know you know this is the thing i think that a really good way to understand this whole discussion is about the the experience of infinite otherness yeah apart from us and yeah. infinite non-otherness that we are right. so linked to everything and yet mm-hmm. we are differentiated from everything yeah and and you know i mean i i really think there's a kind of apocatophysis if I can, if I can combine both words, apophatic yeah. and cata- cataphatic, you know, a kind of apocatophysis that 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 really is is in is at work here. And I, this is why I like the achintya beda beda Vedantic formula from the Chaitanya Vaishnava tradition, <clears throat> because the Upanishads speak about the 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 unity of in all existence, and yet the the infinite unity, and yet the infinite differentiatedness right you know i i don't know how accurate uh, searches are on the internet but i re- one day i just really wanted to know if according to science every snowflake was uniquely shaped and apparently they are unique there isn't one duplicate snowflake now I mean, look, even this phenomenal world is a mind-blowing place. It's just mind-blowing. It's mind-blowing that you and I, and and, and, and who's the other one here? Arjuna. Okay. Uh, the three of us could even be even here. I mean, Sam, you're sitting on 37 trillion cells right now. 37 trillion cells. You know, you have to really consider whether it's worth utilizing your 37 trillion cells to talk to me today. I mean, 
you've got a lot going on over there, okay? You've got this whole biosystem that's freaky complicated. And by the way, each of those 37 trillion cells has a million working parts. You are terribly busy, my dear friend, okay? Now, Arjuna probably has also 37 trillion cells. You know, I mean, and I want to speak of this old guy here, you know? I mean, I've my 37 trillion cells are still kicking, okay? So, I mean, it's amazing that anything works or that everything works. You don't have to go far to be amazed at the extraordinary miracle of reality. I mean, it's just amazing, you know? I mean, what a setup. It really is what a setup. And, and you know, the thing is that, that religion is about what one loves in and about and beyond reality. And that's where the epiphatic and the cataphatic come into play. And, and, you know, again, it's ultimately boils down to what it is it that you love. And I really think at the end of life, on your deathbed, you're going to have to answer these two questions. I think I may have mentioned on this uh, website. Yeah. Uh, this, uh, right? Last right? Yeah. Right. Did, did I mention? Have I loved much and have I loved well? And, you know, part of that is like, what have I been doing as a Christian or a Jew or a, or a Muslim or a Hindu or whatever? Have, have I loved much? Did I love much there? Don't, don't be a Christian just because you were born into it. Be a Christian because you love it, you know? You know, be a Hindu because you you love it. You know, it's uh, these are these are the um I just think we humans can can really delay the most important things and not appreciate all that goes into our even being able to exist every moment. It's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. Now, you know, do you relate that? How do you now, to what do you relate this? Do you relate this to some form of grace? Do you relate it to some way that the universe embraces all of us? The the word Bhagavan, as in Bhagavad, Bhagavad Gita, mm -hmm. Bhagavad means the one who possesses all parts of reality. The one who embraces all parts of reality. That is Bhagavan Sri Krishna. So the bhakta feels this divine embrace in and through everything. And if a bhakta experiences that, I think a bhakta can do well on their deathbed. Not to get morbid here, okay, gentlemen, I don't mean to, you know, be a downer here, okay, but I mean, the mortality, I did Google this uh, this morning, is the mortality rate still 100%? And uh, apparently it is. <laughs> Um, back on the question of Shankaracharya, so yeah, I, I, I quoted earlier. I, I mentioned earlier the argument I, I give against this view of Shankara presented by Rambachan, which is that Madhvacharya and Ramanujacharya were never accused of straw manning Shankara when they gave their arguments against Shankara's presentation, against Shankara's view. Um, so then now when someone like Rambachan comes along and says, oh, actually, here's what Shankara was teaching. And the view presented by Rambachan of Shankara is it's not, not susceptible yes. to those arguments. Yeah, therefore, it's not argument. But also right, related right. to that, um, we have, I don't know what you think of these verses from the Shiva Purana, where uh, Shiva says to Shiva, sorry, I'm, um, Vishnu says to Shiva, and Kali Yuga mislead the people in general by propounding imaginary meanings for the Vedas to bewilder them. And there's another place where Shiva's telling his wife that he's going to come in Kali Yuga and do yeah. this very thing. Right. And we understand this to be Shankara who came to bewilder people and give an imaginary meaning for the Vedas. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, again, there are different angles of vision and, and interpretation of, of, uh, theological history and um 
you know, that that works well. I mean, you know, what, what does that really mean? Though? What what is the Vaishnava tradition really saying when uh, uh, that, that that Shiva is supposed to come as Shankara to, uh, you know, distract or delude uh, persons of Kali Yuga? Well, they're acknowledging how powerful Shankara is. I mean, Shiva is a very powerful, you know, fellow. So they're they're imputing an enormous amount of power to Shankara, and he did have power. He began, you know, he 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 launched, you know, he he, he uh, sort of jump started Vedanta. You know, I mean, he he really started the Prastana Trayi de- declaration of the Prastana Trayi, the three essential texts on which one would have to create commentary to establish a school of thought. I mean, Shankar was brilliant. He was brilliant. But it, you know, what, and, and as much as, you know, uh, uh, Ramana, I think, I think Madhva straw man's uh, Shankara more, much more than Ramana. I think Ramana, frankly, I don't think Ramana was like that bothered by Shankara. I mean, look, Shankara will do the snake thing. Okay. You know, Sam uh, invoked the, the snake thing, the, the rope and the snake. Yeah. Uh, although right? that's, I, I think that comes, the analogy originates in Shankara, but I think it's been used in different ways by the yeah. supposed neo advaitins or whatever. Right. In, in misleading ways. I think that's what, what Rambashan says. But yeah. The um, other thing but, is, sorry, just to briefly say one other thing yeah, before sure. you mm-hmm. continue what you're saying. Um, yeah. is that I don't think it's right to say that Rambachan is saying my interpretation of um, of Shankara is the right way. You know, the, <laughs> like right. he no, explicitly but, yeah. says, like in the Advaita worldview, that you know I'm coming out of my own personal context, which is not as a sannyas and you know someone who's a right. an renunciant. A I'm rocky. a household person. You know, <laughs> I'm family right. and community and, and that sort of thing. And so, yeah. Right. I mean, I'm obviously going to interpret it um, yeah. in a teaches way that's going to affirm the school. world. Teaches yeah, at a Catholic I'm, school. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, like, another thing I want to point out in this question is that like, there's places in the Advaita worldview where Rambachan says, it's unfortunate that Shankara uses this analogy as, you know, uh, God is a, uh, Brahman is a magician and the world is like an illusion or, or whatever. <laughs> it's unfortunate that Shankara uses this because in other words, he acknowledges that there's limitations and problems in Shankara, right. aspects of Shankara. And the whole point of being, you know, uh, him being someone who's a part of the living tradition of Advaita is not to just, you know, blindly assent to whatever Shankara says, because he's Shankara, yeah. You know? But to right, that's right. Carry forward, you know, and you know, in the present day, what he sees to be the, um, you know, separate the wheat from the shaft, so to speak. Or I mean, not like that. By which I mean, like recognizing places where what he says is helpful and true in other places where maybe less aren't helpful and and potentially you know problematic right so yeah i just thought i want to mention that because you because um, yeah i i don't want to people to get the wrong impression that from what um Arjun is saying about how he's asserting that you know my reading is the white the right interpretation you know i've you know yeah, <laughs> he, yeah. yeah anyway that's just all I wanted to say. Yeah. Yeah. No, okay. that's that's helpful. Um, that is helpful. I mean, uh, again, you know, um, let's use your word uh, "take," Sam. I mean, it's the it's how we take things, and and that's the yeah. interesting thing about religion is this dialogue about sharing how we take things, and and Rambachan is taking things in very. I mean, he's looking at things very in a very nuanced, rational way as we'd hope a scholar would do. I mean, that's what scholarship is about, is looking at things. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, it's, it's uh, it was Eugene Delacroix, I think, uh, that, the, that artist of the 19th century, I think he said something like, um, it's the genius of, of humans is not coming up with something new, but rather it's about looking at, it's, it's about saying more about things that have already been said. You know, yeah, it's the need to say more about things that have already been said and, and, and to go deeper, you know. 
So I think really good dialogue in religion is about the mm -hmm. more, you know, it's about the more that needs to be said. And there is more that needs to be said. And the very fact that there's a commentarial tradition in so many of these uh, traditions uh, that, uh, that, that really further and illuminate and, in some sense, you could say uh, update traditions. Now, I think that's really important. So, you know, I mean, the, the, look, the, the rope and the snake, you know, I mean, the fact is there are many, as you alluded earlier, uh, Sam, there are many qualities of a rope that are shared with a snake. I mean, they just are. I mean, you know, they, they wind around, they're long, you know, they might even be a similar color. And, you know, while well, Shankara says, you know, when you wake up, the rope doesn't exist and the, and the snake doesn't exist. But the fact is there are ropes and there are snakes that could be mistaken one for the other. And the word illusion comes from the, the Latin illudo, which means to play, you know, to, to play. And, and, you know, when, uh, you know, it's the play of the, of the, of the way a, a snake looks like a rope. And therefore, you jump over the rope when, when you didn't have to. You know, that, yeah, that, that, I think that's a really important connection because obviously that's very similar to the words lila, you know, the play of that's right, of Brahman. That's right. Um, yeah, there's one other question I had in this connection, which uh, it's not really a question, but just something to mention, I guess, and then hear your thoughts on um, in the Advaita worldview. Rambachan says that, um, I'll have to find the exact quote, but he's saying that there's five different um, aspects or do, uh, ways to of divine up how you view the world. I, I think he says something like, oh yeah, reality. He says it's like, you know, an, an illus illusory reality, an illusion, if it's not real, something, you know, like if you're in a dream and then you wake up and then it's, you know, um, different to waking reality. Um, and then he speaks of um, empirical reality, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I'm just trying to remember what the exact words are. Pratyaksha? Pratyaksha? Yes. Pramana? Yeah, yeah. Do, 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 do you know, yeah. maybe you could say a little bit more, cause just because I need to find out the passage that I'm, which I'm looking at. But I think he, uh, um, I want to mention that just because, according to him, Shankara doesn't say that empirical reality is um, false so much as um, oh, I'll have to find it. Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd love, to, I'd love to hear the passage uh, that you're talking about. Um, and, and that's, and you see, that's, that's what's interesting about Rambachan is that he points out that Shankara really is not quite the devil he's made out to be. But of course, the Bhakti schools will point out that there are snakes and that there are ropes and there are reasons why people dream about them. So it's not like the dream is utterly false. Right. Exactly. I mean, if I if I if I say to Arjuna right now, uh, you know, Arjuna, there are uh, snake. Don't move, Arjuna. There are serpents uh, curl uh, swimming around above your head right now. So don't move. I, that's not illusory. That's delusional. Yeah. Yeah. If I'm delusional, you know, you really need to commit me to you know an insane asylum. I'm I'm imagining snakes going around Arjuna's head. They're just not there. But if I see a rope and I go, oh, my God, Sam, watch out. You practically stepped on a snake. Now, you're not going to think I'm crazy. Say, ah, guess what? Dr. Schweig, you know, you're mistaken. There's a rope there. That's all. Oh, yeah. I'm so with you. Yeah, so I found this passage. And yeah. illusion are different. Yeah, go on. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty much what you're saying. So he says there's four ontological levels. Unreality is that which doesn't exist. Right. You know, an unreal object is neither an unreal object like a square circle is neither sublatable nor sub, non sublatable. The world clearly does not belong to that category. Right. So that's already a, a kind of 
refutation of the, some common understanding of Shankara as saying that the world is not real or whatever. And then the second level is illusory reality, which is, you know, prati, prati basika, sata. He mm-hmm. says illusory reality is sublatable, you know, like optical and sensory illusions, you know, like mistaking a rope for a snake and so on. And dream experiences belong to that category. And then he says Shankara differentiates the world from that as well, you know, because Shankara says in places that, in certain places that he quotes that illusions and dreams are subjective and sublatable, <laughs> whereas the individual never sublates the world. So, in other words, Shankara is not a subjective idealist. <laughs> he makes right. that very clear. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and then thirdly, um, empirical, yes, when I was thinking of, or pragmatic reality, the category to which the world belongs. And then the fourth is obviously absolute reality. Um, param, param artika sata. That's the, mm-hmm. that's Brahman. Right. Um, but the, here's the key thing. He says, when the truth of Brahman's non-duality is understood, the world, unlike an illusion, does not cease to be. It's the false view of the world that is destroyed. There we go. Beautiful. Right. And that's, yeah. Like that. Which is what I was trying to say earlier. And um, so, yeah, I that's was. The avidya. That's, that's the avidya, false view of right. the world. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. And so that is, if that's what, um, I mean, I guess it's he that, he, um, neither here nor there whether this is an accurate or, inter- you know, completely correct interpretation of Shankara. If there right. is such a thing, I don't think there is. But yeah. at, at least that makes far more sense to me you know like if you like the problem is you understanding the world um to be as if you don't understand the world to be from brahman but instead you superimpose you know that um adhyasa in, in sanskrit the nature of the world on brahman which is, I take it that that's what idolatry is, <laughs> you know, right. you're mistaking, in all traditions, idolatry is you're mistaking a finite object for being in the infinite, you know, right? Right. Right. If that's what all the um, the problem is with his language of superimposition, you know, mm-hmm. um, then, yeah, not, not only does that make, does that seem like a charitable way to read someone, but it seems to make most sense of, um, what I, yeah, take to be like the truth in a non-dual um, yes. way of human reality. So, so yeah. No, yeah, um, these, these these are always yeah. tricky things. Yeah, a blasphemy and idolatry. Human beings are forever caught between the two. Uh, uh, idolatry is to is to impute greater value than what's there in, in something. And blasphemy is to, you know, treat something as having lesser value than it really has. So, you know, it, it's, it, it, we, 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 human beings tend to be idolatrous and blasphemous at the same time in, in various areas of their lives, um, giving too much value to something and too little value to something, respectively. Um, mm-hmm. And, 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 you know, the, the, the issue of, of, I mean, Western traditions, I mean, you know, this is one of the things that paints a different tenor to, to uh, Western traditions, the, the prohibition of, of, uh, of, you know, thou shalt not, you know, create any graven image of me, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, I, for I'm a jealous God, something to that effect, right? In the Decalogue, right? If if the Decalogue were written in, in Hinduism, it would go the Thou shalt create as many forms of me as you possibly can, because endless are my forms, and I am endless, and your love for me is endless. So it would be an opposite commandment. It, it, you know, in, in India, it's like there is no limit to the way the unlimited can impute to the limited. His unlimited power. That that if if the unlimited wants to take a limited object and infuse it with the unlimited, it can do it. No problem. But in the West, that's a little bit of a problem. So of course the Christians found a loophole. Well, 
no graven image. Well, it didn't say anything about a human. We can send a human down here, you know. So we can't create a golden cow, but we can we can create a Jesus, and that works, right? But it didn't work for the Muslims. The Muslims said no. You know, God had a. They say God had a son. God can have a thousand sons. What's the big deal? It's all glory be to God, not to sons. And then they claim, of course, that Muhammad, I mean, Muhammad is every bit like a Jesus without the divinity part. Anyways, you see how these different traditions have, they just have different ways of expressing, you know, their love for the divine. And love paints different pictures. So it's, I, I you know, I don't want to be this, uh, you know, the, the, this kind of, you uh, you know, everything goes type of person. But no, it's each tradition is, it's like, it's like theological lapidary. You know, each, each tradition refines and polishes their theological visions that allow it to glow more and more and more, just like stones, gems. The more you polish it, the more it glows. Theological lapidary. Sorry for the term. It's a little awkward, but you know, it's there. So there would be particular ontological views of the divine that do hurt bhakti, though, and I guess we're referring to those as Mayavad. And uh, we we hear presentations that what Shankaracharya taught was that uh, that real reality is completely devoid of any qualities, um, and even when we attain spiritual realization, that's nothing that actually happens. We simply just um, stop forgetting our actual position. And so we don't merge back into that reality. We just become aware of it again or whatever the illusion ceases or the false perception that we had of being in this world goes away and we return to this state of oneness with reality that's devoid of any attributes. Um, and that kind of idea, there's, there's nowhere to offer the bhakti. There's nowhere for the bhakti. There's, there's nowhere for the object of the bhakti. Yeah. Um, and there's actually no ontological distinction between me and God. It's just all one thing, and I merge back into it. And so, is that not what Shankara taught? You know, um, I, 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 again, these sort of um, things, I think, it developed more sort of uh, um, reified. I think these kinds of theological reifications uh, become more and more uh, distinct later on. I think Shankara remains more abstruse uh, in my reading, if, if if I recall correctly, in my reading of the Shardi Dr. Mimak Subhashya. He he really remains um, more like like the foundation, which is impersonal in one sense, but you can see where the house would be built in another sense. You see, it's it's not oh, it's, no, it's not, not an empty lot with no foundation, and yet it's not a whole house either. It's you know, it's funny because I had a, a, a friends of mine, a, a, a married couple, and they went up to a retreat in a Dwayton uh, monastery up in Pennsylvania. And they were practicing meditation. They were being guided by, this is uh, Dayananda's uh, Saraswati, uh, I think his name was, I'm not sure, but anyway, uh, the recent, uh, 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 late, the late Dayananda uh, up there in Pennsylvania. Anyway, some of the head uh, swamis, the, 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 um, followers who keep running the place were guiding both of them in meditation along with many others and then they had a private meeting with the swami and they said where where do we ultimately go i mean what what happens what's the ultimate state that i can look forward to right and the swami said well it's like it's like an extremely deep sleep for all eternity and 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 the, and the woman she gasped and turned to her husband and said, Ken, I don't want to be in a coma for the rest of eternity. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> this was her reaction. You know, I don't want to be in a, in a coma for forever, you know? And, and so, you know, again, I think, you know, the more I'm thinking about it, this, this idea of of the foundation of a house i kind of like it this this i've never th th thought of it this way until our discussion 
But, you know, it's the outline of a house. Every foundation is the outline of a house. But yet it's not a house. I think Shankara is like that. It's not an empty lot either. You know, it's not Shunya. You know, it's, you know, it's, 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 it, it, it's, it's a foundation. It's raw. It's a kind of raw, uh, uh, you know, theism, if you will. Um, and, uh, uh, or a raw theology, you could say, uh, perhaps. Um, uh, it's, it's, it, 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 on, on top of which, you know, uh, it depends on what you want to build. Now, some of his followers tear the foundation down even. You know, they, they don't even want the foundation there or they don't care about the foundation. But really, I think, I think what Ramachan, if I'm reading Ramachan correctly, I think he wants to show that actually there, there is a foundation. There is something, you know, it's, it's not just all via negativa, you know. It, it, it's somewhere between via negativa and via positiva, you know. It, it's, it's that liminal area. But that's, that could be unnerving to a very, you know, um, right. you, you know, very strong theist. Uh, yeah, and, and I guess that's why, that's where the point that David Bentley Hart was making last time, where it's important to recognize that we all have different dispositions and temperaments, theologically right. speaking. Right, like, um, like you could argue that those who are more inclined to, you know, philosophical thinking, or in Hindi, um, in Sanskrit, Sanskrit terms, jhana yoga, you know, yeah. yoga, the yoga of knowledge, um, um, will find Shankara and those like Shankara and other mystical traditions um, to mm -hmm. be the like the best way to connect with God, really <laughs> connect with the ultimate. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, you know, that's kind of worship, so to speak, even though it's not actually worshiping a particular um, Deva or God. Yeah. Uh, right. But, but, you know, to, to just uh, uh, build on your point here, Sam, I mean, I, if you want me to make matters even more complex, one of my mm -hmm. very favorite professors uh, of all my schooling experience, Wilfred Cantwell Smith. Yeah. You know, he basically said there are as many religions as there are persons. Okay, now, okay, now where do we go? You know, I mean, wow. So, and, and you know, someone like, um, uh, 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 what, what's her name? Um, uh, someone I studied with a little bit at Harvard. Uh, oh my gosh, okay. It's been too long, it's too long ago. But anyway, <laughs> Um, she was a psychoanalytic thinker of religion, and she she wrote um, the the birth of the living God. Um, anyway, she did a study, and basically she finds I mean there's this supposition that a community of of followers will have the exact same Jesus. Let's say we're talking about a church and a certain denomination. There's the assumption that your Jesus is exactly the same as my Jesus. And it ain't true. Mm. She did studies. In fact, she also did studies with people who had a, a 10 year old Jesus. And then there's a 20 year old Jesus, you know, when you turn 20. And then there's a 40 year old Jesus. And then a 50 year old Jesus. They're different. So even developmentally, the Jesus has changed. And, and your Jesus and my Jesus are not the same, even though we go to the same church and we hear the same minister or priest. So, you know, this is the wonderful, I mean, why do you think my son became a professor of mathematics? Because at least there's something, you know, two and two is pretty much four. I mean, it, you know, it, it's like you know, this gr infinite gray area of religion is just too much. But then, of course, he went into higher math. And we both connected on the concept of infinity, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, then, you know, we started talking on that. Of course, I cannot understand anything he does. I really can't. You know, there's combinatorics and uh, topology, mathematics, and all this stuff. I, I have a thesis. I can't read one word. I, I mean, really, it's, it's, and I'm, I'm not a stupid person. I'm, 
not the brightest bulb in the room, but I can't read one word of his thesis. Anyway, mathematics is its own little world. You know, it has its own language. But I think he got into that because he saw his father deal, having to negotiate these infinite shades of blue and green and yellow and gray and yeah you know, and, and purple and so on. And you know, as a as a scholar of religion, you better put on your seatbelt because that's what you're gonna have to do, you know. We'll have to wrap up shortly. Um this one more point I wanted to make, which we're probably get us going for another forty minutes, but maybe we can just briefly touch on it. Um, I was having we'll a discussion with a yeah. with a, a Harry Krishna in India who was messaging me with some doubts based on arguments he's heard from Muslims and Christians about, if you know, basically arguments for divine simplicity that God has to be one thing, you know, absolutely one with all his parts. He can't have otherwise, you know, if he, if his any of his qualities are separate things from himself, then he's dependent on those. So there just has to be one thing. And I was saying, uh, you know, simultaneous oneness and difference. An arm is not a leg. A name is something you, you know. So my question to him was, uh, if divine simplicity were true, then anything you say about the name of God would also have to be true of the form of God. Oh, and obviously that's not the case. One of them is a sound vibration. Another one's something you look at. They're different. So there's there's a unity <laughs> And, uh, you know, of course, you, you can also answer those kinds of objections by talking about priority ontology, that that those things are sustained by God. They rest on God and ultimately God's not dependent on his parts. The parts issue from him, that yeah. qualities issue from yeah. him. But um, having this discussion brought me some clarity. It seems like there's one thing I appreciate about Shankara and the Indian schools of thought is that they were very thorough and the debates, you know, were, were, were really intense and they would. Uh, so Shankar uh, uh, um, gave an exposition of a complete philosophy, a complete ontology, including all of its entailments. Whereas often, at least in, in my experience of seeing some of these, um, like some some Christian understandings and stuff, it seems like they're some of it's sort of speculated and pieced together, but the entailments aren't fully fleshed out. For example, of the with divine simplicity, if it's the case that one feature of God is identical in every way with other every other feature of God, then basically yeah, you know this this devotee was actually sad. so I was like, well, it you know we we have this experience of a leg being different from an arm, even if it's God's. Uh, of course, you know, I don't see God's arm, but you know I hear God's name and I see God's form as the deity, or I, I hear the description of God, which is supposed to be identical with God in one sense, but also the description of God is different from God in another sense. So there's simultaneous oneness and difference. But if you want to, but he was saying things like, oh no, but that's the way it appears to us. Which to me reads like that Mayavad, you know, that we it's not to Krishna that we pray, but to the impersonal absolute, which is beyond Krishna. And this seems to be an entailment of this philosophy that if you want to say everything is identical in every way, if it's God, then basically you have to say our experience of God, anything we experience of God is an illusion because we're experiencing that God's eyes are different from his legs or his feet, that they have a different shape, they look different, and so on. So that has to become an illusion, and then we're right in the Mayavad camp. I think, yeah. you, 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 um, Arjuna, I, I think you need to understand that appearance is not an illusion. <laughs> an appearance is always of a reality. You know, like, an appearance is just, I think the problem occurs when you, um, you illicitly import language of like false illusion or whatever into the language of appearance. Like, you know, an appearance is just an appearance, you know. Well, does it does something. the appearance represent the way God actually is, or is it a false appearance? If there's truth behind it, then there is simultaneous oneness and difference. If there's no truth behind it, then it's an illusion. Right. Yeah, I think that's false economy. So like I think every appearance of reality or God is simultaneously so it so it's a disclosure of some aspect of the infinite but it's also a concealment simultaneously i think you have to view both at the same time because every finite manifestation or appearance of the infinite necessarily is also a concealment of you know the infinitely many other <laughs> appearances right um so that's how i would Try to understand mm -hmm. the language of um, what non-duality in general, but in particular in Shankara, Shankara means. 
just just one point and then I'll hand it over to Graham. But it's not even conceivable that you could have an appearance that didn't um, stray from there being some differences. You know, that like any kind of appearance you're going to have, there's going to be a sound vibration which differs from an, an appearance or so on. So yeah, it's not even conceivable that you could have anything. So that that would represent this underlying reality of saying it's all identical in one thing. But yeah, go Graham, please comment. <laughs> well, oh, I just with that, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I I often uh, go into arenas where uh, they teach yoga and teacher trainings of yoga, and I I cover the philosophy part. And sometimes they come up to me and they say, you know, I, I get it, I get it. It's all one. I said, yeah, yeah, it's all one. That's right. That's right. I said, but it's not just all one. Hey, but it is all one. You're right. But it's not just all one. Because if it were just all one, I wouldn't be standing here and you wouldn't be sitting there and you wouldn't be saying that to me. Nice. To assert oneness means there has to be some d distinction. To, to, to assert union means there has to be two things that unite. Even the word religion, you know, comes from religare, right? To, to connect, to connect again, to again connect. It means that we were once connected, we got disconnected, and religion is about reconnection. You know, and, and, and when it comes down to, and I'll just say this, when the Upanishads, and Shankaracharya is interpreting the Upanishads, and Ramanuja is interpreting the Upanishads, really, the more... You can slant it, you know, the Dwaitan or Dwaitan viewpoint. But there I am studying the Bhagavad Gita at Harvard, sitting in a class with Daniel H.H. H. Ingalls, the foremost Indologist of the last century, in Widener A, you know, in that dungeon, dingy, dusty, horrible room that we're all crammed into. Um, and it's the same room that even T.S. Eliot learned Sanskrit. <clears throat> anyway, so I'm going, so we're going around the room. We're each reading verses from Shankara's commentary and, you know, and, and, and the original text. And we're supposed to be able to speak about the commentary that we're, uh, of the text that we're reading. So I get chapter 7, verse 24. Vyaktim, vyaktim. Uh, so vyaktim, what? Vyaktam, vyaktim, apana manyante mama buddha param bhava majanantum mamavya yamanutamam. Okay, so this is a verse that clearly destroys the idea that Krishna comes from the absolute unmanifest and he, he insists that that he does not and it so clearly seems to defeat any kind of idea of this kind of um, absolute you know uh, uh, kind of um, uh, uh, you know absolute oneness without difference and Shankara ironically had no commentary under that verse and I was so disappointed that he literally did. So I raised my hand. I said, Professor Ingalls, he practically puts commentary under every verse. Why does he not do it under this verse, which directly addresses this whole metaphysical question? And I didn't get a very satisfactory answer from Ingalls, but maybe I, I remember it to this day. So maybe it's sticking with me. He said, commentators comment on what they want. What they don't want to comment on, they don't comment. So, you know, so in one sense, you know, if you cherry pick parts of the philosophy of the Upanishads and or the Gita Upanishad, you know, you can pick the things that, you know, don't challenge your school. But it's interesting if you can pick the things that do challenge your school and give it a certain light, a different angle of vision and appreciation that still, while you're still being uh, uh, true, you know, um, 
uh, uh, you know, um, loyal to your school of thought. So anyway, I was very disappointed. So, you know, again, Sam's word, you know, take. What do we take and what do we leave behind? That's, that's the other thing. What do we take? How do we take it? What do we leave and why do we leave it? There you got theology in a few sentences right there. Yeah, I think in general, just to elaborate a little bit, or to continue a little bit what you're saying, I think every take, so to speak, is also a leaving simultaneously. That's what I was trying to say earlier about how every man manifestation or appearance is simultaneously a concealment. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. Um, sim so too, similarly, every take of reality, that is to say, every... Um, way we perceive i mean the word perceive from the latin it means to take like to grasp literally means mm. you know, to, to, to grasp uh the way we take or grasp perceive reality in any mm. moment in time um is at the same time to not take and thereby to leave <laughs> you know, yeah. some some other way you could perceive or to grasp reality right mm -hmm. so that's why it's, it's import, always important i think to always acknowledge the finitude of our takes yeah. of reality or our perceptions of reality regardless of yes and, we the, the, and, and the finiteness of of our taking but the infinite possibilities in the kinds of things that yeah. are revealed and from being concealed in, in out of grace exactly you have to and acknowledge that every every um this is uh, say, every every take is a gift so to speak you know you can't yeah. take something unless you're given it obviously yes. usually. Yeah. things given to you given to your sight given to given to you in some way um, you can't do it unless it's there for you yeah. to take. And that's where grace is, yeah, comes in and it's also, well, comes in yeah. is kind of the wrong way to put it in the first place. That's where grace is necessarily prior or, or, or always already there. You know? Yes. Right. I'm, yeah. I, in fact, you're making me recall a beautiful passage from the Yoga Sutra, which mm. speaks about, you know, talking about a, a being given or uh, grasp to take to grasp grahitra uh, grahana grahya the 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 grasper or the the one who embraces the embracing and that which is to be embraced now again right. you can't embrace something that's not there but as you as we as in meditation in 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 in, in true samadhi meditation we are it's not a passive thing we are embracing the absolute mm -hmm. But the word in Sanskrit that best conveys the idea of grace is anugraha. Can you hear the same word at work? Grahitra, grahana, grahya, anugraha. That which follows the embracing, that which responds to the embracing. So that's grace. And, and then it describes um, the state of being anointed, anjanata a state of being anointed what very so the meditator is is embracing but the meditated upon object embraces back what verse was that um 141 in the samadhi pada yeah samadhi pada of yoga sutra but you have to read my translation don't read anyone else okay. <laughs> right. edwin well, edwin bryant's one i i found really helpful we'll put a link for that oh, in the description yeah yeah um Edwin, I know Edwin, he's a wonderful scholar, but he is, his forte is not in translation. His forte is in historical tracing okay. of theology and philosophy. Interesting to know. So just just beware. And you you practically I'll have to learn won't... Sanskrit myself now. <laughs> yeah, there that, there you go. But I'm I try to translate in such a way that people like you don't have to learn Sanskrit, that you will feel what it's like when you read the richness. Uh, of meanings in the in the original so 
Um, back on that point I was touching to about the philosophies being fleshed out to their entailment. I think one thing that one issue I have too is often, you know, a philosophy will call something like Advaita. And then when I give pushback on it, people will present something which basically I, I understand to be a chincha beta beta tapfa that they sort of skirt around some of the logical problems for Advaita by bringing in a kind of oneness and difference. So it's kind of like, I mean, why not just give it a name that actually is what you're saying? So when they say things like, oh, divine simplicity means all of God's features are identical in every way. It's like, okay, then it would follow from that, that anything you can say about God's form would also be true in every way about his name. But that's not the case. Yeah. So they can't mean strict identity. So why not just use words that are what you actually say and then we don't have this back and forth of well if you say if, if that's what you're saying yeah. then this is a result and I say oh well that's not what I'm saying it's like well I why think did you the say problem it there is is analytic yeah. philosophies to be honest <laughs> the way analytic in my experience the way analytic philosophers have tried to articulate the quote-unquote doctrine of divine simplicity um in figures like Anselm or Aquinas I, I found to be very unhelpful um the way I understand divine simplicity is just the claim that in God, there's no division or composition. Like that's a really simple way of explaining it. And I think that has to be true. I mean, however you, whatever problems that gives in some people's mind, um, it has to be true that um, um, this apophatic, you know, claim that in God, um, there's no um, divisional composition. Um, but yeah, that's obviously another whole discussion. And I, I know you want to end soon. In and of itself, um, yes, indeed. Yeah. But, but, but I'll, maybe I'll just end by saying that, um, you know, this is where maybe like a, dis a distinction which you can find in Eastern, Eastern Orthodoxy. Um, but you can also find equivalents in um, Vedanta or Dharmic traditions as well. You know, the distinction between the essence and the energies, you know, of mm -hmm. God. The essence is the absolute or God in itself, right? Nirguna Brahman, if you will, and Saguna Brahman, the energies, or energia means like the activities, the way in which the absolute manifest itself in in relative things right so i think that's um i mean whatever you might think of that distinction um in like eastern orthodoxy the energies the essence energies distinction i i think that um it's at least one way one prominent you know way to make sense of divine simplicity um, yeah, I think those are yeah. good points. I think in modern philosophy, they call what we mean when we say that unity, whereas the identity claim is the one that runs into the logical problem. So I had this discussion with Ryan Mullins where I explained my understanding of mm. what Harry Christians mean when they say God is non different, you know, his name, form, energy, pastimes, and so on are all non different. And he's like, oh yeah, yeah, that's unity. That's that's what in philosophy we call unity. That's not divine simplicity. That's not uh, identity. Hmm. But uh, yeah, anyway, I think we should yeah. wrap it up. Yeah, yeah. So Samuel Watkins that doesn't yeah. agree with Ryan Mullins's take on a few things. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any final comments, Graham or Samuel? Well, for me, simply, um, it's a worthy struggle. Um, uh, you know. Um, uh, many of the bhakti theologians, some of the uh, most brilliant ones uh, hundreds of years ago, uh, who espoused nuanced theological uh, treatises, end up pushing the limits, really, of their theology at the time, and then end up writing poetry. I think that a successful theologian, if they're truly successful, ends up in the realm of poetry. So um, next time we'll have to we'll have to talk about theology and poetry, theopoetics. Right. Sure. Uh, that's an interesting topic. Yeah, <laughs> that's an interesting topic. And it's it's about the again, the heart, it's almost like 
you know, a, a bhakta's heart, you know, a bhakta's embodiment in this life. But the, the light, the heart becomes so filled with love that it bursts out of this, uh, th these shackles of a body, uh, and we call that death, to be able to be liberated into a realm that can accommodate a heart that is so full and brimming over constantly. And I think that poetry from theology is a kind of expression of that kind of graduation. Mm -hmm. But never, never abandonment, never abandoning theology, but it's, all, it's, it's almost like the, the, the vase for flowers. The vase holds the flowers, but then there's the flowers, there's the bouquet. That's the poetry. The vase is the theology. Cool. Thank you very much, Graham, for your time. And thanks, Samuel, for coming on and asking some good questions. Um, we'll leave it there. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, we're going to have uh, Graham and Rambachan on at some point in the future to have a dialogue related subjects. Yeah. So that's not one to be missed. And I'll see you in the next one. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much.